Hello, and welcome to an overview of operant conditioning, a behavioral learning theory. This is the third in a series of six presentations on behavioral learning theories as they apply to schooling and education. My name is Bill Hewitt, and I am Professor Emeritus at Valdosta State University and adjunct faculty at Capella and Walden University. There are two primary objectives for this presentation. First, after viewing the presentation, you will be able to name and describe the basic model of opera conditioning. And second, you will be able to name and describe the components of the operant conditioning model. As discussed in the overview, all behavioral theories consider the organism as a black box. By organism, behaviors mean animals, and they consider human beings to belong to that category. Their proposal is that there is a direct connection between environmental stimuli and animal behavior, and the laws of behavior are universally applicable to all animals. Also, remember that classical conditioning involves studying those stimuli that will elicit or activate an involuntary behavior that already exists within the organism, while the focus of operant conditioning is on voluntary behavior and the impact that environmental stimuli labeled consequences have on the increase or decrease of the frequency of a specific target behavior. Operant conditioning reflects a three-term model. It starts with a voluntary behavior emitted by the organism. That is followed by a stimulus labeled a consequence that changes the probability that the target behavior occurs again. That is, the frequency of the target behavior or response must either increase or decrease as a result of being followed by a stimulus. Otherwise, that stimulus is not labeled as a consequence. A stimulus that follows a response but does not change the probability that the response will occur again is labeled a neutral stimulus. It is important to understand that the label that should be applied to stimuli is not known until after the change in behavior has occurred. We will return to this issue later in the presentation. An antecedent stimulus is a stimulus that signals that the next target response will be followed by a consequence. It does not actually change the frequency of the response. It merely signals that a consequence will follow the next target behavior. For example, as a child, my mother always referred to me as Bill or Billy. When she said, William Gregory, that meant I need to stop an undesirable behavior immediately. Perhaps that's why parents give children middle names. It provides mother with an antecedent stimulus to let their children know when they have had enough. When the presentation of an antecedent stimulus actually results in a changed behavior, the technical term that is used is discriminant stimulus. That is, the organism is able to discriminate between a stimulus that is a signal that a consequence is coming and one that is not a signal. There are three major theorists responsible for the initial development and elaboration of operant conditioning. The first was Edward Thorndike, who lived between 1874 and 1949. He was responsible for developing the law of effect, which states that under certain conditions, a stimulus following a behavior will increase or decrease the tendency for that behavior to occur again. This concept was developed further by John Watson, who lived between 1878 and 1958. Watson's famous statement was, give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, and my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might have select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant chief, and yes, even beggar man and thief. Regardless of his talents, penchants, tendencies, abilities, vocations, and race of his ancestors. While most opera conditioning theorists might not take the statement at face value, there is a tendency for operant conditioning theorists to focus on conditions in the environment when explaining behavior. The third, and definitely the most influential of the operant conditioning theorists, is B.F. Skinner, who lived between 1904 and 1990. He is considered one of the very first American psychologists, as those before him had achieved much, if not all, of their training in Europe. The behavioral approach to learning 
especially operant conditioning in all of its forms, was the dominant learning paradigm in the USA from the 1930s through the 1950s and was initially replaced by humanism and cognitive processing theories. Even today, it is quite often the standard by which other theories are compared when discussing the efficacy of a new learning theory. The first step in using operant conditioning is to identify a target behavior as well as the behavior that the organism is already emitting that can be modified. For example, if a teacher wants a student to raise his hand before speaking, any movement of a hand would be the initial behavior that would be modified into raising a hand behavior. The next step is to identify possible consequences. There are two types, positive, which are sometimes referred to as pleasant, and negative, which are sometimes labeled aversive. As previously stated, it is not known exactly how any particular stimulus will be labeled after it is presented to the organism, that is, the learner. It is simply a best guess at this point. Despite the investigator's knowledge of the learner, it is possible to be wrong in one's initial labeling of a stimulus. For example, food and money and hanging out with friends might all be considered as positive consequences. However, the learner might be lactose intolerant, which would make eating the ice cream a potentially negative stimulus. Likewise, offering money in a specific situation might be either neutral, the person does not need money or does not enough to change one's behavior, or perhaps even negative. For example, after a first date, a young man says, I really had a good time, I'd like to see you again, and hands the young woman $10. In that situation, the money would very likely be labeled as a negative stimulus. The same might be true for socializing. For a strong introvert, being invited to meet new people could easily be labeled as a negative stimulus. The point is that the label given a stimulus, either a positive or negative consequence or a neutral stimulus, is only legitimately made after observing behavior. That is, from the perspective of operant conditioning theory, a stimulus is either a consequence that is, the probability of the target behavior occurring changes after it has been added or subtracted from the learner's environment, or it is a neutral stimulus when adding or subtracting the stimulus does not change the probability of it occurring again. In this sense, operant conditioning always works. Either the behavior changes after the application of a stimulus, in which case the stimulus is labeled a consequence, or it does not in which case the stimulus is labeled a neutral stimulus. If behavior changes, then operant conditioning was used. If behavior does not change, then operant conditioning was not used. There are two actions that can be taken with a stimulus. It can be added to the learner's environment or it can be subtracted or taken away. Finally, there are two results that can be achieved by adding or subtracting a positive or negative stimulus it can result in an increase in the probability that the emitted behavior will occur again, or it can result in a decrease in that probability. To summarize, there are five components to using operant conditioning. First, one must identify a target behavior that will be the focus of conditioning. Second, the investigator must decide whether that target behavior will be increased from its present base rate or whether it will be decreased. Third, the investigator must select a stimulus that will be used to modify the emitted behavior. Fourth, the investigator must add or subtract that stimulus after the behavior has been emitted. Finally, the result must be observed to see if the intentions have, in fact, been met, or at least are moving in that direction. There are four major operant conditioning techniques that result from identifying the purpose of the behavior change, that is, to state whether the target behavior should be increased or decreased. Selecting a stimulus, either a stimulus that is thought to be positive or pleasant, or one that is thought to be negative or aversive. Next, an action is selected. That is, to add a pleasant or positive stimulus, in which case the technique of positive reinforcement is considered to have been used, 
to increase the frequency of a target behavior or add a negative or aversive stimulus, in which case the technique of punishment is considered to have been used to decrease a target behavior. Likewise, a negative or aversive stimulus can be subtracted, in which case the technique of negative reinforcement is considered to have been used to increase the frequency of a target behavior, or a pleasant or positive stimulus can be subtracted, in which case the technique of response cost is considered to have been used to decrease the frequency of the target behavior. In general, it is always best to use positive reinforcement if possible. That is, look for a behavior that you want the learner to increase in frequency and add a pleasant stimulus after the target behavior or an approximation of that behavior has been emitted. If the learner will not emit a behavior that can be positively reinforced, the next best alternative is to place the learner in a situation that a negative stimulus can be subtracted when the learner emits a response that approximates the desired behavior. While it is generally best to focus on increasing desired behaviors, it is sometimes necessary to focus on decreasing inappropriate behaviors. In that case, it is best to first subtract a pleasant stimulus from the learner's environment and then add it back when the learner behaves in a more appropriate manner. Finally, there are times when a behavior is detrimental to the self or others and punishment is warranted. However, the punishment should be done in a way that the negative stimulus that has been added to decrease the inappropriate behavior can be subtracted when the learner behaves in a more appropriate manner. Once that occurs, then a pleasant stimulus can be added to increase the likelihood that the appropriate behavior will increase in frequency. This presentation is focused on an overview of operant conditioning. Two previous presentations focused on an overview of behavioral theories and classical conditioning. Two additional presentations will continue to the discussion of operant conditioning. The presentations on behavioral learning theories will be completed with a discussion of behavior modification techniques. In addition to the six presentations related to the behavioral learning theories, there are several short quizzes that learners can use to check their understandings of the different learning theories.